while we're on the topic of Spirit Week, today's Superhero Day. Do you do you have a superhero that you love the most? I mean, who doesn't love Wonder Woman? I feel like any little girl just like <laughs> felt the power. But you know, you can always make up your own superhero. Like, grab a towel, put it around your neck. You're your own <laughs> superhero. I feel like you are. This day and age, whatever you're into, you can find something to, you know, generate some sort of inspiration. That's fantastic. We're talking with Heather Petrie, four-time Olympian, two silvers, a gold, a bronze. Uh, Spirit Week has, has been a theme. We're talking about it. And I was saying when, when I thought Spirit Week, I said, I got to get a hold of Pete. I mean, I talked to her because you you exude this. So where where does this just joy for everything? I mean, not that you don't have – we all, we, all, we all have our bad days. Where does this general joy come from? Well, you know, I actually thought about that because of this week and because I knew you wanted to talk to me about it. And I realized that when I was young, I actually was quite shy. I know most people know that know me as an adult might think that's insane. But I think it was because I had all this zest, this enthusiasm just to champion whatever I was doing. And I felt like I needed to blend in with everyone. So I would try so hard to just not be that person that was out loud. And I found over time that it just doesn't work for me. That, I mean, whenever you come to a group, some part of your being is gonna be lit up. And I think over time I started sharing that more and more and more. Um, and it, it, it was different with every group, to be honest. I wasn't always out loud, but I, I definitely had some something that I love to champion. Um, and I think that that's important to recognize whatever part of your journey you're on, um, kind of connect with it and then share it with others. That vulnerability will help inspire them to be themselves and, you know, bring out something that may inspire you right back. I think that a lot of people that played with you would, would describe you as a great teammate. You know, when, when your name comes up, there's, there's almost always a smile. Uh, and as we talk about things that people can work on, without a pool, right? We're talking about the mental game and all that stuff. First, for starters, what, what does it mean to be a good teammate to you? What, what does that look like in your mind? Well, to me, that's honestly the ultimate compliment. I got chills when you said that um, because I don't think we can do anything in life without people, um, whether that's your teammates, your families, your supporters, whoever they are, find them and cherish them. Um, and especially in times that are hard, like it's not always going to be roses and kittens. Um, so I think it's about support. It's about genuinely championing someone else um, and, and raising them up if they need it or just being silly with them or whatever is needed in the moment. Um, and that helps deepen the bonds um, that you'll need to live this life. Well, was there something, let, let's, let's first look at it like what, what you loved uh, getting from a teammate. So you know, when you think of your of your 12 teammates or however big the training group was, what what would they do that made you feel good and that you liked from from them as far as them being your teammate? You know, uh, I loved hugs. So physical <laughs> contact for me, whether that's hugs or high fives, um, really helped me, especially when I was like kind of losing it. Um, to center me back to what I needed to do. And it was something I cultivated with every one of my teammates, including, if Brenda is watching this, Brenda Vio <laughs> hated hugs. Um, not not a hugger. <laughs> not anymore, though. She will yeah. arm it, and she will come yeah. right in. Um, so for me, it was just that affirmation. It was that physical connection or even just mental connection that I had with them, knowing that they were there for me. Um, but that comes in many forms. It doesn't have to be a hug, it doesn't have to be a high five. It could be something really subtle, um, it could be a look even, um, but for me, it's connection. So this is, this is a, an especially tough time for you during this pandemic where hugs are kind of outlawed. You guys, I feel like I'm withering, like withering away like <laughs> a plant that doesn't have water. So, I mean, when this, this quarantine's over, please, like all the hugs, I just, I welcome them. <laughs> a big old bear hug. I learned them from my father. He was the best hugger and I was re ready and willing to give some out. So, uh, yes, after <laughs> this time, please. And now going the other way. So you, you're this great teammate to others. Was it one size fits all or did you try and, and give something different to each person depending on what they needed? I think it's definitely different for every person. You know, teams are made up of such unique individuals 
And you know, yes, I'm out loud most of the time and coming at you with that massive hug um, and want to bring the, the energy, but sometimes it's not needed. And someone just needs you to sit next to them and listen or just stare at the wall with them. Um, and I think that's really important because I had many teammates that were just more, much more quiet and uh, were like, Heather, put the brakes. And that's okay. I think that's great. It's a, a way for them to know that I'm there for them, but need a little less for me, which is fine. Um, and that's, that's the beauty of, of being able to communicate with your teammates and, and people in your life. We're talking with Heather Petrie, four-time Olympian, highly decorated water polo player, talking about Spirit Week and about being a great teammate and all those good things. And we were talking a little bit earlier today for, for something fun coming down the road, but looking back at that, at that London final. And, and I said this a lot, and I'll say it to a different audience too, but we talk so much about the intangibles you bring, right? And it's never to, to discredit what you, what you could do in the pool, right? We just watched it. You had a beautiful lob goal in the gold medal final in London, which I know still gives you chills when you think about it. But you have been very upfront in saying that you made four Olympic teams, but you know, in some cases, you made them by the skin of your teeth, you know, and I think for, for you especially, I think that set you apart was all this other stuff you bring, this positive energy, this being a great teammate. So many people that watch these videos, I think, are, are struggling to find their role on a team, and maybe they're not the one that scores 10 goals a game or they make all the saves, but they want to be a valuable asset. Just, just you know, can you kind of speak to making these very high-level teams and part of that being what you brought maybe outside of the water. For sure. I think, you know, number one, as being part of that many teams, I, I would have done anything that the coach needed me to do in order to stay on that team. I loved playing and I loved learning and being better and trying to be better with a group of people. So, you know, to be honest, in the very beginning when I was added on the national team in 2000, I had absolutely no idea why I was chosen at that time. <laughs> I was so blown away and starstruck by my teammates that all I knew was that I was showing up every day with the best I could give and I was hoping to learn from different people and I knew that I had strengths. I was very fast. I was a fast swimmer, um, really good at defense. My brain thinks in that defensive mindset. Um, so I focused on those, you know, in the beginning I was going to do that to the best of my ability and try and learn and then slowly as teams morphed and new team members came on, I was going to need to do something different, you know. And everyone, Brendan and I actually talked about this in terms of scoring goals. You mentioned it. I uh, only scored two goals in four Olympics, which, you know, a lot of people would feel really heartbroken about that. It was never my focus. If I got a goal, awesome. I was so stoked on field blocks, on, on defending people great, making sure they weren't scoring. Um, that I think it's just about focusing on what you can do and what you can improve on and how to grow and how to best make your other teammates good too. Because as you raise them up, they raise you up. And it doesn't matter how, like, I don't need to be in the scoring column saying a leading scorer. Maybe that's a motivation for some people, but it doesn't have to be the only thing. Um, and then to me, something that was so important was, like you said, the outside, the pool, making sure that our team was cohesive, checking in. I loved my connections with my teammates. Um, it was something I, I really put a lot of effort into. So if that's your jam, go for that. Like that <laughs> also be a very valuable part of a, a successful team. You, you talked about your two goals. What was the other goal in the, in the Olympics that you scored? Uh, it was against Italy in 2008. Was, I believe that was a semi or a quarter. Got it. Um, and especially being against Italy. I played in Italy. I loved my yeah. time playing there. So it felt really interesting to know those players so well and find that opening. Uh, so that was an exciting day for me, too. I think that there was a fist pump thrown. I'm not one to throw a lot of fist pumps, but I think there was during that game. No, because I, I, I vividly remember a photo of, of you. And maybe it's from Olympics or it's from a world, but it's like you with a fist pump and there's like water everywhere. It's a, it's a very water polo picture, but, um, and you're smiling. It's, it's classic you. Um, so we're, we're, we're talking here with Heather Petrie, four-time Olympian. And uh, we had college week a couple of weeks ago, and we had a coach come on from every level of college. And regardless, club, NAIA, Division one, they all said the same thing about being being adaptable and willing to like find a role. You just talked about that, but I, I think a lot of people, as we kind of talk about that point more about being a good teammate, even when you assemble an Olympic team, to your point, right, it, it isn't as if the coach just goes down the list and says, all right, give me the top 11 scorers and two goalies, and we'll see what we get. It's like an all-star game, right? It really just – 
speak to how that group has to gel together as one and everyone really has to find their role to be a good teammate to the other 12 women. Yeah, I mean, case in point of, of making sure you understand that a team is not always just the best individual players in each different thing, like the best shooter, the best defender, because often, you know, those best don't mesh well. And I think that the bigger picture of coming together as a team um, has so many layers in terms of what are you willing to sacrifice from your own self to make other people better. And oftentimes people with big egos and I, you know, I haven't played with tons of them, but I feel like they can clash and create problems all the way through a team that can actually take away from the, the bigger endpoint or the goal that the team has um, to be successful. So, you know, I love seeing teams that put together individuals who may be on paper, uh, you're like, who's that kid? I mean, how many times <laughs> I'm sure they've said that about me. They're like, who's this girl coming from nowhere? You know, never made a junior team. Don't know where she came from. Played two years, made an Olympic team um, in college. So I just think that you can't say um, you can't to an athlete. I think as you put what yourself into something, um, it allows the coach then to choose you for the, that puzzle piece. And ultimately the puzzle will be successful if all of them fit together. People always were mistaken when they would say Heather Petrie, and then I realized, oh, they don't, they don't know what they're about to get right now. This is someone that knows what they're doing, uh, and, they, and they would find out the hard way. This whole shutdown, stoppage has really tested everyone's resilience, right? They're unable to do the things they love to do, whether it's give hugs or play water polo or be around their teammates. You had tough moments with, with Team USA over 12-plus years. How, how do you describe your resiliency and how did you develop it from, say, Sydney on? Yeah, that, that, it's definitely about growth. I think that that is a big thing you said in terms of what I experienced um, when I was young in, in Sydney all the way through my time uh, in 2012. And I think you have to look at life and your journey in sport as a growing period and that you're always going to be faced with something new. Um, I remember someone, I'm sure it might have been Guy Baker or a coach prior, just said, get comfortable being uncomfortable. And it's always stuck with me because there's going to be something that comes up that you have to think, oh boy, you know, I don't like this. I don't know what I'm going to do. And that's okay. First thing to do is recognize it um, and then realize that you can't fight it. And so the, I got so much better. And this was with help from teammates, from coaches, from our sports psych to really acknowledge the feelings that you're having. It's okay not to be okay. And to be aware of them, those things is actually super important so that you can be where you are and kind of make a game plan to get out of that rather than just, oh God, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, and get stuck where you are. So, you know, throughout that time, whether it was injuries or not playing well, or just being generally unsure of, like you said, where I sit on a team, I just basically tried to hold on to the controllables, what I could control, uh, were things like my attitude, how I treated my teammates, what I brought to the game every day. Um, and that ultimately helped me through. It's even helping me now. I mean, my job disappeared within a matter of a second, um, just like many people's have. And then your outlets, getting in the pool, oh man, I need to rehydrate my gills so bad. I'm like <laughs> struggle town. All those things are gone. So what else can we do? Um, for me, I started diving back into meditation. I love that part of sport, um, checking with myself every day. I started a class um, just so I could keep learning. I mean, I have access to the internet in my home. So that's something I did. Um, so I hope that everyone out there is finding ways. I know there's so much that USA Water Polo is offering right now with the at-home stuff, 6-8 sports, a ton of different fitness apps are out there. Just find something and work on it and just be stoked as you do it. And every little thing is like checking a box. We're talking with Heather Petrie here, four-time Olympian, member of Team USA, four-time Olympic medalist. Taking your questions as well, if you have any for, for Heather here. There's quite a few Heather fans here in the, in the comments, so that's wonderful to see. Thanks, <laughs> there's, <guys>. the, <laughs> there's the pom-pom. Um, we've been talking about your Olympic – experience and and i'm curious you know obviously winning gold is probably at the very top of the list but is there something else that comes to mind when you think of just an all-time favorite memory yes um 
you know, there were some, a lot of firsts that I got to experience with our program um, from going to the very first Olympics for women, uh, women's water polo in 2000, and just getting to be part of that group with these legends of teammates that had been fighting. And even those ha who weren't there with us had been fighting for us to have that opportunity. Um, man, chills right now, chills. <laughs> so cool um, just to have experienced that and know what is possible, like what the opportunities were out there for us after that. Um, that was obviously the first. And then the second was being part of the world championship team that won uh, in 2003 in, um, in Barcelona. Barcelona. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, we, we hadn't really stepped on that world stage yet either. We had been to the Olympics, but the Olympics isn't everyone. Uh, world championships is every team out there. And um, I felt like it was just a great moment where you looked around and we used to say, at least in foreign places, listen for the silence because they didn't like it when we won. They were all about the European teams. They wanted to see that success um, and it would get so quiet. And we were like, oh my gosh, we're doing so well. And winning there and having that first uh, gold medal there at World Championships, or not first, I think it's our second in program history, um, maybe one in the 70s. But anywho, it was just amazing. I, being part of it and seeing my teammates' success, um, it's actually online right now. I think FEMA yeah. is, is casting it. Um, and I was on a text chain with Erica Lorenz and um, Ellen Estes Lee. And we were just, they dominated in that game. And it was just so cool to see it and just celebrate them too, because they were my teammates so long ago. So yes, lots of fun memories. A couple of questions coming in here now. Uh, Luca asks, when did you start playing water polo? That is a great question. And I have a very different story than most humans out there. I started very late. So I was an avid swimmer growing up um, in my area. I swam every summer. And I didn't find water polo until my sophomore year in high school where I played with the boys team. So we didn't have a women's team. I played with the boys, fell in love. All of those teammates helped foster this love for the sport. And we started a girls team at my high school in my junior year. So I was decently 16, 17 when I first started playing water polo. And then how old were you at the Sydney games? I was 22 in Sydney and then uh, Fast forward for the four Olympics, and I was 34 in the London Olympics. I think I was the oldest team member from the U.S. I'm not sure what the oldest player, oh, besides Maureen um, in, in Sydney, was 39. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity out there for you guys. Just keep playing, get after it, have some fun. That, that's just wild to think that as a, as a 16, 17-year-old, you're just starting this sport, and five years later, you're at the top of it. Yeah, mind-blowing even to me now. Um, <laughs> That's another thing to think about all you awesome athletes out there is that a lot of people may say you can't. Um, I heard that a lot. Like, you can't do that. You, you've only played a year. You, you can't go play in college. Like, all these things. But I also felt deep in my heart I, what I wanted to do. And I had some great supporters, whether it was my family or coaches in my sphere, that really helped me see that there was an opportunity out there. So don't listen to I can't. Find your way. Your path is going to be different than everybody else's. Don't look at those other people and just figure out what makes you tick. Next question was, have you ever played open water water polo? I have. I've played in the ocean. Um, I haven't played very many times. I would love to play more. It was super fun. There are so many different elements to uh, playing in open water. For example, we played in Monterey the first time I played, and there were waves. So you'd be like thinking <laughs> at the top of a wave and the wave would go down and you drop and you shoot and you hit something, like not the goal, something <laughs> off. Um, so it just created some really interesting dynamics to the game. Um, I know that they're creating more and more opportunities with open water polo, four on fours. And I think that's incredible opportunities for more people to play. I want to play that one day. I mean, at least I need to get back in the pool, swim a little bit first. But yes, all the playing, let's do that. Uh, this this next question, and, and this is as you alluded to, your experience was different in that, you know, in your high school time, you started with the boys team, and then I know you helped launch the girls program there, but it, it comes up every every interview. How do you get recognized in order to play at that higher level? You've obviously spent some time coaching at the college ranks too, but just generally speaking, what's what's been some good advice for people to take that next step? I just think play as much as you can, be exposed to as much as you can. 
Um, there are camps, there's clinics out there. There's ways to learn more from everyone. And the more that you're doing that, the more you're playing games and being seen by different people, you'll start one, improving and just having more fun. And then two, kind of being noticed by the community as a, as a whole, as being a, a valuable part of a team. And that even if you haven't been to a tryout or a, go to the tryouts, I still remember I was a freshman um, at Berkeley and our coach Maureen was on the national team. And she's like, oh, there's a tryout at, at, at a UC Davis this weekend. And I was like, uh, okay, I've played two seasons in high school and I've been playing here a few months. And she's like, just go, just go see how it goes. And I'm like, oh my gosh. But it was, ended up being incredible because I was playing against people that were doing things to me I'd never seen before. It just showed me a whole new part of water polo. So always challenge yourself, always find ways to learn. And I mean, even now, there's so many things that we're doing at home that can make you better. We're talking with Heather Petrie, four-time Olympian here for Team USA. You mentioned Maureen O'Toole kind of giving you a nudge. And, you know, you probably at the time not realizing it, but she's seeing something in you and saying, hey, you should go. This will probably be a good thing for you. How, how important over your career was it to have people that were invested in your success and that believed in what you wanted to believe in? I mean, I actually feel like the people in my sphere, my coaches, my parents, probably knew more than I did. I, I was like late to the party most of the time. <laughs> I'm just like, I love doing this, this is great, but I had no idea what was possible or what opportunities were out there and how raw of um, abilities I had. So I'm so blessed to those people from high school, from my summer club, from my parents to just keep pushing, nudging. And they weren't telling me to go. They were just like, you can do it. You can do it. And honestly, that was the best gift I could have been given because over time that gave me a little bit more confidence to try again and try again and try again. So be somebody's nudge, be somebody's support staff so that they can make their dreams come true. It doesn't have to be loud, it just has to be there. That's excellent. Uh, Pete, you're just unloading a ton of excellent advice here. So people are really, really enjoying this. Uh, you, you mentioned that you're longing to get back in the pool. What, what are you doing at home right now? What's some other things people can do at home if they don't have pool access to try and still feel like they're doing something? I mean, do anything, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I, I will some days just get out and walk and walk and walk and walk on trails. Um, there's a trail near my house stay distance from folks but there are a ton of apps out there um, that are bringing high level fitness activities right to your living room to your room to your garage to your outdoor space wherever you are um i know you guys have stuff on your space 6 a yep. bridge athletics is out there there's a ton of free stuff that you can find i've been using a new one called owl moves i really like it um i just found it during quarantine so be open to anything out there or just get a ball. I have one in my room and, and throw it around and just be connected to it. That next question here is, is there anyone on the current national team that you had a chance to mentor and what, and what, and what was that like? Well, I mean, I don't know if mentor is the right word per se, but I just feel like being someone's teammate is a chance for you to interact with someone that, um, hopefully you absorb something from them and they absorb something from you. Um, two on the current national team is Melissa Seidemann and uh, Maggie Steffens. I'm such big fans of them. And I got to be with them when they were relatively young coming on the team and they were so incredible and I saw it. I don't know if they knew it yet. Mags definitely jumped out in London, but seeing Melissa's uh, journey towards being a leader and just a dominant athlete has been so incredible. So it's just about supporting those around you. Um, I know people when they were older, like Maureen O'Toole being my coach at Cal, but then also being my national team teammate, um, and then even competitors. So most of my teammates when I was young were playing at other colleges, UCLA, USC, other places, and they came on and, and embraced me. Um, and they were my heroes, seeing them and knowing how good they were and just having them welcome me. So be welcoming, be willing to learn something from somebody else and offer your own to your teammates. I think that's the best way to do it. And um, I actually still love those connections that I get from them even now. Next question here, talking in general about self-care, you've, you've, you've covered kind of the exercise part of it, but what else are you doing in a time like this to, to kind of maybe help keep things feel a little bit normal? 
Yeah, I mean, definitely when things are not normal, tap into something you love to do. Um, something that kind of takes your brain away from the madness or uncertainty. Um, and I also think it's also taking your phone out of the situation. I, we are all glued to these things all day. Yep. So if you can put it down for a minute, um, I love cooking. I have always loved to cook and I've kind of gotten into it when I was on, an, on the national team using it as a way to fuel my body. But now I will find a recipe, I'll go into the kitchen and I'll just make it and hopefully be able to give it to my friends, my neighbors, my mom. Because um, if I'm eating all this food, it's probably not a good idea. Um, but that's just something for me. I also have taken up um, drawing and some art skills. Not a good artist, but it's been really <laughs> fun. Just tap into something new. Just try it. Why not? Well, and, and, and you make super healthy meals. I feel like everything I see you post has a variety of like super healthy stuff in there where it's like your your take on, you know, maybe a more mainstream item, but you've made it, you've replaced all the junk and put in all the, all the healthy stuff. Greg, I try. I feel like <laughs> number one, I'm lactose intolerant and for years was like, oh, it's okay. I'll just eat cheese and ice cream because I love them. So I hadn't quite realized what kind of inflammatory effect that had had on me. Um, it wasn't until after I stopped playing that I tested out new things and there's so much available. And so just understanding what it is you're putting into your body, you don't by any means have to stop eating cakes and cookies and treats because guess what? Those all make your life a better place. But what else can you do? Can you eat more vegetables? What can you substitute? Um, just to kind of give yourself some more energy. So yeah, I, I do a lot of experimenting in the kitchen just to kind of see what it makes me feel like. Oh my gosh, I mean, Mel. Hello. Hi Mel, yeah. Mel's watching. <laughs> well, it's the side of it here joining us. Thanks Mel for stopping by. Uh, yeah, it's funny, I, you know, when talking about the health food, I always give uh, Liz, Liz Grimes a hard time about this. I remember years ago, she was eating this stuff that now everyone like knows to be healthy food like, you know, nut, nut butters and all of that stuff. I remember thinking that that was like voodoo that she was bringing out from somewhere. And now it's like the most commonplace stuff. And, you know, people like you and her ahead of the curve bring, bring these healthier items in. So well, This is a smart lady, that girl. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking with Heather Petrie, four-time Olympian for Team USA. If you have any questions here, we'll take a couple of more here for, for Heather. We've, we've talked about your sports memories and kind of the impact that it's had on, on your life. And obviously now, you you know, you've been in this game. It's probably hard to imagine a life without water polo. But but when you think about what it what it's meant to you, you know, how do you, you know, if you if you kind of pictured, and this is going to get like into those TED Talk things, but if you pictured like your like emotional tank, you know, like how much of it has been filled up by the joy that water polo brings you? Oh, goodness. I mean, <clears throat> a majority of it, like we're talking like 80%. I feel like my my life in sport and, and what we were able to take away from it in terms of the connections I have and the ability to fail and learn how to stand back up and keep going and that you're still okay are all so, so, so important just for life. And that in itself brings, brings you more joy, um, knowing how to live my life better, be a better person, be a better friend, be a better... Um, anything really. And that all came from sports. And then not only that, getting the chance to travel and see different cultures, um, be in some really interesting experiences all over the world with my teammates, not only in water polo, um, but it, it's basically made me who I am. And so when you talk to me about being this like crazy excitement, excited, enthusiastic <laughs> human, it was all through experiences from sport, I think, um, and with my friends and family from growing up. Um, so, you know, a lot of it was definitely from from water polo, and I, I can see that it will still continue to be that way. I'm still integrated, whether it's in coaching or just following the teams or just going to local pools and floating. I mean, all of it. It's, just, <laughs> it's super important for life. So, yes, a lot of my life is due to water polo. A couple of good questions coming in here. Uh, what's a good workout to build up your shoulders? Oh, goodness. Man, I don't think I need any bigger shoulders. <laughs> uh, but uh, without without joking, um, I, I, anything really. I think the bigger picture with st shoulder stability is that we use the throwing motion so much and we have a tendency to forget our backs. Um, and the more you can do rehab type exercises and 
and stuff like that. I can't tell you exactly what to do because I think everybody's different. I yeah. was really, really lucky in terms of having great uh, swimming technique when I was young. So I've never had a shoulder injury from all those hours and hours of swimming um, or from throwing. So I'm blessed in that realm. I've had other injuries, but um, yeah, just keep at it. Never, never stop moving and always keep these little muscles fired. Uh, another sort of te technique question, but it's about getting your hips out of the water. I, I would, I would guess it would be, you know, ways to kind of work on your leg strength. But the question was, how do you get your hips out of the water for more than five seconds? That sounds tough. I mean, vertically, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe work on your, uh, on your jumping. That was something that was really um, impactful to, I mean, to me as an athlete, when we went from, um, we got a new person working with us, Tim Pillow. He still works with our team. Um, he had a lot of background in the gym with volleyball. And he started incorporating all these land movements. And I mean, if you've met me or most of my teammates, we're not land humans. We are 100% aquatic. And by incorporating all these jumping motions, we started vertically rising out of the water so much better. So t Tim, you're a hero. Thank you for that. Um, in terms of maybe if you're talking about if you're if you're um, being grabbed in, in de as a defender, it means you're being grabbed, so your hips are down. So pop your hips away from that person. Get away, please. Don't be grabbed. Um, but other than that, yeah, a lot of it's leg strength. Uh, another one coming in here. What what sort of uh, team culture or a culture in general gave you the best experience? So what, I, I guess was there a certain type of team culture or guidance that you responded to best? I mean, you, as you mentioned, you had, you had many, many different coaches over time. You were successful with many of them, but was there one that maybe you leaned towards that maybe you use in your coaching? You know, I think I've gained something from every coach that I've had. Um, I'm definitely like a, a person who leans in, in terms of kind, kindness and compassion and love, uh, supporting and celebrating what we're doing as a group. Um, but I honestly had took something away from every single coach, whether it was Mo, um, Guy Baker, Adam Krikorian, all my teammates, all my coaches from overseas, um, they all shared something. And you know what, even more are my teammates, because they're just as much of a coach um, as even our staff is. You know, I don't think there was one that was better. I think there was always a process to, to find that magic. Um, I definitely think I felt it really strongly when we were in London. Um, we had had some setbacks as a group prior um, in 2011 and, and before and had had to work through them in order to find those cracks and patch them and find ways to work through any adversity that we faced. And College kids are back home. They used to be in the dorms. They're back home. Sports brings families together so often. You were many. And, you know, how, how people now would live to have a weekend on a pool deck where, they're, where they had to hang out and watch their kids play. And I think athletes get this opportunity where you have all these big events every year and you can have your family attend. And it almost becomes like mile markers, right? So mm -hmm. remember, we all went to this and then we all had to go to that. Over your career, how, how much did it mean to you to be able to integrate your family so much into what you did so that you can literally, I'm sure, go back and say, oh, six, I remember this. They were there. No, eight, this happened. What does that mean to you as, as kind of everyone's reflecting now on family time? 100%. I think um, I used to live by those markers, like you said, like, okay, when's that Olympics? When that, when's that World Championships? When's that Collegiate Championship? Um, and my family did too. And I'm starting to understand that a little bit more. Um, I recently found a box of stuff from way back in college and it had an email in there of my dad planning out his work schedule based on when he was going to come to support the team. And so I know it started way back when we were young and they'd come to support us at whatever, you know, ASYO soccer or whatever <laughs> thing we were doing. Um, yeah. progressed all the way to the Olympic level. My parents got to go to both, uh, or all, all, both, four of them, um, for the Olympics, as well as my aunt and uncle and several other family members. My brother got to go to them as well. Um, and just having them there and having them be part of that experience, um, like you said, creates these memories that we tap into now. Um, plus the travel is so important, was so exciting, just allows you to get out of your space. We all know that we are locked in right now and wouldn't we give to go anywhere with our people. So um, it's also a chance to kind of soak up a new place, a new culture um, and have that experience together. You can't, you, there's nothing that replaces it. Awesome. Uh, Pete, always, always good to talk with you. Uh, glad to hear you're still as fired up and 
patriotic and full of team spirit as ever. Uh, and we're looking forward to uh, getting you back in the pool very, very soon. Uh, hope you're doing well. Take, take care. Stay safe. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks for having me on.